very much. Can you all hear me at the back? Yeah, good, okay. So first of all, I'd just like to thank the organizers for inviting me today and for very kindly slotting me into the New Horizons session at short notice, which of course, this is not New Horizons. Um, it is bread and butter dietetic work, but I'm hoping that what I'll present to you today is um, the results of our work that will give you a new way at looking at how to estimate requirements. So as you may all know, the new pocket guide is due to be published very, very soon. I saw a picture of it the other day and it's now going to be called the backpack guide. It's enormous, um, but that's because it's full of good stuff. Um, the, my particular role in the um, pocket guide has been over the last 20 years to write the section on estimating um, nutritional requirements. And up until uh, 2003, I did it on my own. And then from 2009, I worked together with Claire Salisbury, who's now in Liverpool, to write that chapter. And at, up until this version, um, what we did is we sat down together, we had a few phone calls, we did a bit of a search, and we wrote the chapter. Um, when Bruno and Vera approached us to write the chapter again for this version, I had had the experience of working very closely with uh, Christine Baldwin on systematic reviews, and I'd been involved in two um, guideline development programs, and was therefore very aware of the limitations of what we had put into the pocket guide up until now. So I pitched to the Penn Group that we should do a formal guideline development process for this chapter, and um, they very kindly paid for us to do that. So what you will find in the chapter now is the result of five systematic reviews on energy, um, the result of a systematic review of guidelines for protein, and the result of um, formal reviews of fluid and electrolyte requirements and micronutrients um, um, undertaken for this particular pocket guide. And today I'm going to focus on what we did for energy requirements. But before we go any further, I'd just like to remind people what a guideline is. It is, um, they are recommendations that are designed to assist us in making decisions, informed decisions, um, but they are based on the best available evidence. Now, I would argue that the last time we updated the chapter, the evidence that we presented was at the bottom of that pyramid, i.e. expert opinion, editorials, and a nice night in the pub. Um, I think now that the um, uh, evidence that we're providing is uh, further up the pyramid, but as I describe what we go went through to, to um, write this chapter, you'll see it's still not at the top of the pyramid. So before we start, I want to just get some definitions. So total energy expenditure is that energy that we expend doing everything every day, and it's usually measured by the doubly labelled water technique, which can give you an indication of people's total energy expenditure over periods of up to 14 days. What that doesn't tell you, though, is which components of energy expenditure people are using. And in clinical studies, what is generally measured is basal metabolic rate, which is that energy we expend lying still at physical and mental rest, doing nothing else. Um, ideally, the person who's having this measurement made should be um, fully fasted for uh, overnight, should not have had any stimulatory activity the day before, such as um, physical activity, extreme physical activity, and they shouldn't have drunk a lot of alcohol and coffee. And if you fulfill all those criteria, you can get a very good basal metabolic rate measurement using indirect calorimetry or putting someone in a 24-hour respiratory chamber, um, and it's highly reproducible in individuals. Now, if you think about those conditions I've described to you that you would need to meet to get a good BMR measurement, you can imagine that that might be quite hard to achieve in the clinical setting. Um, quite often in clinical settings, it's not necessarily possible to fully fast your patients. Um, and I've had experience where I've measured patients where head injuries, where it wasn't possible for them to lie still long enough. So often the measurements that you will see reported in studies, in clinical studies, are actually called resting energy expenditure. And they will fulfill as many of those BMR requirements as possible, but they may not fulfill all of them. The next component is diet-induced thermogenesis, which is generally taken to be 10% of a mixed meal, although if you have a very high-protein diet, it could be higher. 
And if the patient is fully fasted, this component of energy expenditure is missing because you're not um, uh, generating any um, diet-induced thermogenesis. And then the final component is physical activity, which we all know is extremely variable between individuals and with individuals on a day-by-day -day basis. And increasingly, this is being measured by accelerometers, multi-sensor monitors, and pedometers. Although, having searched the literature over the last couple of years, there are still relatively few studies um, in clinical settings where these types of um, measurements have been done. So if we're thinking about measuring the, um, estimating the requirements of a, a patient in hospital or in the community, at any one time, we can't know exactly what their requirements are because anyone's um, energy requirements are determined by a whole host of factors that affect your energy expenditure. And I've just mentioned a few of them here, um, variations between people's um, energy requirements in terms of their age and their sex, their weight and their body composition, their type and severity of illness, whether they're chronically infl inflamed or acutely um, unwell, what kind of interventions they might be having. We know that certain um, medical or surgical interventions raise people's metabolic rate, while others, like pharmaceutical interventions, might lower it. And also physical activity. Is it the same to walk around, um, like we are at the moment, fit and well? Um, do you use the same amount of energy as you would if you were walking around using a Zimmer frame? or if you were walking around with an artificial limb. So there are lots of factors that affect people's energy requirements and disease, and this requires, whichever method you use, a certain application of clinical judgment. So I'm going to just talk very briefly about the methods we have available to us. Obviously, in some clinical conditions, national and international guidelines recommend that in certain conditions, such as acutely ill or um, uh, mechanically ventilated obese patients or patients acutely ill with hep hepatic disease, they recommend indirect calorimetry. Now, I've done this talk now about 22 times in the last year, and I've yet to come across anyone who used indirect calorimetry in clinical practice in either of those conditions. If anyone has, come and tell me afterwards. But what we normally use is an estimation method. Either the factorial method that we recommended last time, or regression equations, or rule of thumb. Um, and I'm going to go through each of these very quickly. So the PENG guidelines that we wrote last time and have been writing for quite a few years, um, the underlying principle of this is that you use basal metabolic rate prediction equations derived for healthy populations, and then you adjust them for illness in individuals. And what we currently recommend is you use the BMR prediction equation, and then you adjust it for various factors such as metabolic stress, activity, and DIT. Now, we've been very severely criticized for doing that, and I can understand why if you think about that underlying principle. Um, the thing that we tended to um, tend to forget when we use the Henry equation is the majority of clinical studies compare me measure, measured energy expenditure with the Harris-Benedict equations. Now, the Harris-Benedict equations were published in 1919, and the data collected for those were collected over the 10 years before that. And I would argue that the population that um, the Harris-Benedict equations were undertaken in is very different from us now. They were young, they were slim, and they were fit. And the sorts of people we see in hospital are not that. Um, we'd also had reported to us that people were inappropriately using higher stress factors than might be good for a patient. And also, um, some of the stress factors we included in our last version um, could have been seen as slightly inappropriate because people's cl the clinical management of some conditions changes over time. So, for example, in HIV infection, some of the studies we included were from the 1990s, before the advent of antiretroviral treatment. And obviously, at that time, patients were acutely unwell and um, uh, had a lot of malnutrition if they had HIV, whereas now it's a very different kind of disease. So another method you can use is disease-specific regression equations. And the underlying principle of this is to use a combination of static measures and physiological parameters to estimate requirements in specific populations. And you may be familiar with the Ayrton Jones ones for obese patients or the Pennsylvania State ones for um, ICU patients. 
The important thing about these is they are usually derived from and validated in specific clinical populations, so they're applicable to specific clinical um, uh, groups of patients. Most often they've been derived in intensive care, but we did find them in some other conditions, such as um, rheumatoid arthritis and um, in COPD. So they are available. The criticism of this method, though, is that there are no guidelines at the moment on how frequently you might have to reassess requirements and amend them in the light of these physiological changes. And we've got no ed evidence at the moment that feeding people two regimens based on these disease-specific um, equations makes any difference to outcome. Is it better to feed them to that than 1,500 calories a day or not? We don't know. And the final method that we can use is the uh, rule of thumb formulae. And the underlying principle of uh, that is it estimates requirements based on an energy value per kilogram body weight or per kilogram fat-free mass. And this is the method that's most often recommended by national and international guidelines. So, for example, that's a nice recommendation for people who are requiring nutritional support um, and are not at risk of refeeding. They are usually derived from clinical studies where resting energy expenditure was measured in specific conditions under standardised conditions. But at the moment, there are no defined criteria for when you might use 20 cows per kilogram body weight, 25, 30 or 35. It's very unclear. It's also quite often unclear when you look at the recommendations whether they're referring to resting energy expenditure or total energy expenditure, and I hope I've shown to you that those two things are very different. It's also unclear whether the recommendations apply to people who are obese and underweight, and whether you should be using um, a percentage ideal body weight or other adjustments, and the evidence for both of those is still out at the moment. And also people criticise this method because it doesn't account for differences in energy expenditure due to age or sex. So all of the prediction methods we have available to us may over or underestimate someone's requirements compared to their measured energy expenditure. They are often inadequately or poorly validated in the populations for which they are designed. And while they may have a good predictive value for groups of individuals, they often have very poor predictive values for individuals themselves. Just by standing and looking at a patient, you can't necessarily tell whether they need 20 cows per kilogram body weight or 25. So they're open to misinterpretation with the potential for clinical consequences of over and under feeding, and all of them require clinical judgment. So when we designed our guidelines, um, we had all of those considerations in mind before we designed our five systematic reviews. Now we could have um, spent the next 25 years doing systematic reviews in every possible clinical condition where you might want to provide nutritional support. But we didn't have the time or the money for that and also we wanted our weekends back. So we did five systematic reviews and they focused on what were the requirements of patients who are metabolically stressed, what are the requirements of those who are, not, who are metabolically stable, what are the requirements of people who are the extremes of BMI, um, less than 18.5 or greater than 30, and because we'd been specifically asked to look at this, what are the requirements of people requiring long-term nutritional support in neuromuscular conditions. So when we did our systematic reviews, we were looking for um, standardised um, valid measures of resting energy expenditure, total energy expenditure, or physical activity, and patients likely to require nutritional support. Now, I've underlined and bolded that because we understand that the PENG pocket guide is often used across dietetic practice. We have not designed this update to be used in that way. This is the, the guidelines that we provided are purely for patients likely to require nutritional support because those were the sorts of studies we were looking at. Uh, we searched five databases and we excluded certain things like ICU because that was being looked at by somebody else, um, conditions like anorexia nervosa or obesity syndromes where they weren't requiring nutritional support and things like um, studies in pre-antiretroviral um, um, studies in HIV patients. So we had 
uh, over 43,000 titles and abstracts, um, and that whittled down over a period of six months to actually just under 300 studies that we were able to include in the guidelines. Um, and we tried to make sure that the studies that we included were good measures of resting energy expenditure or total energy expenditure or physical activity in clinical settings only. The majority of the studies that we found, more than 90%, only reported resting energy expenditure. So we still don't have very much evidence at all on what the total energy expenditure of clinical patients are and what the physical activity levels are. We found more than 30 different disease states across all the different um, care settings that you might want to come across. However, we were quite surprised by the quality of some of the studies that we found. A significant proportion didn't report on the gender of the patients in the studies. They didn't report on the weight, the BMI, or the nutritional status. And very few of them reported on clinical parameters that might indicate the patient's metabolic state. So there's a lot of lack of evidence out there, despite the fact that we originally had more than 30,000 titles to look at. So the chapter starts like this, and the main point is we say very clearly that we are estimating requirements, we're not calculating them, because we do not know at any time what the actual requirements are. It's an estimate, it's a starting point only, and it requires the application of clinical judgment and monitoring. And if I don't leave you with anything else from today, that's the main point I want to get across. And it's, there's a flowchart, which I'll show you in a minute, but the aims of the flowchart is to establish the goals of nutritional treatment. You need to obtain data on age, weight, BMI, and diagnosis, metabolic state, and nutritional status of your patient. And then we've provided two main tables for you. One where we've got um, resting energy expenditure measurements in clinical settings uh, according to patient's um, um, body weight, and a second one according to calories per kilogram fat-free mass. So we're using the rule of thumb method as a baseline, and then you have to consider adding a factor for diet-induced thermogenesis and physical activity. Because um, in these studies, we've used studies where resting energy expenditure has been measured. And um, that's what the flow chart looks like. And that little red circle, I know you can't see what it says, but what it actually gives you is some advice about what to do if when you look through the tables, the person that you are looking for um, doesn't happen to be in the tables. We give some generic advice. So basically, you estimate the requirements by cals per kilogram body weight for resting energy expenditure, and then you add a factor for DIT and um, physical activity. And this is what each of the tables are going to look like. So you've got the clinical condition on the left, then you've got six columns. Uh, first two relate to people with a BMI of less than 18.5. The second two relate to people with a normal BMI. And the th third two relate to people with a BMI of oh, 30 or more. And then within each of those BMI categories, we've got studies re relating to people under 65 and over 65. Now, what you will see when you look at that immediately is there are lots of gaps, yeah? Massive number of gaps right across the board. Um, if you, I've shown you the one with GI disease specifically for today. And what you can see is we've got some data in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis in people with a normal BMI um, under 65 and some with a low BMI under 65, but nothing for obese patients and nothing for anyone over 65. Okay? And what you'll find when you look through the tables, oh, there are a lot of gaps, and there are particularly gaps in the underweight and the overweight categories. Um, we've also added some comments um, where some studies might have told us something about the metabolic state of the patients. We put those in the comments section. And then the final column tells you the studies which we got the information from and the size of the studies. And when you look at the size of some of these studies, you'll be surprised how small they are and how small the amount of evidence is for each of the conditions that we're able to talk about. So that's what you do to estimate their resting energy expenditure in cows per kilogram body weight. And then we give you a table for um, estimating their physical activity and DIT.
And again, this is an estimate because as I've already said to you, when we were looking through the literature, we found very, very few studies where physical activity and TEE were measured in clinical settings. So sometimes you will see when you look at the chapter, a little statement at the bottom that says, <laughs> I'm nearly done, uh, Pend Requirements Guideline Group Consensus Opinion. And that is what it is. It's the lowest level of evidence. It's our opinion based on our understanding of the literature that we could find. The chapter does also include um, additional information like how to determine metabolic status and specific sections on what to do in patients with um, fluid overload, amputees, burns and neurodisabilities and the bits on fluid electrolytes and micronutrients. Um, I used to have a date on this for when the pocket guide was going to be published, but I no longer have one on there. But I have been assured it will be ready for the um, clinical update next month. At the same time, we will be putting up some online resources. So we found thousands and thousands and thousands of studies. We've included about 300. But we have put on the online resources studies where we've found regression equations and we've given you information about the type of um, populations in case you choose to use one of those. And we have also put on the online resources um, studies where they've measured total energy expenditure and physical activity. There are a few of them, but we just thought we'd give you that information to help inform your clinical decision. We've been doing national and local study days like this. We're preparing papers for peer-reviewed journal, and we will be putting up some online training for people um, to use the new um, chapter later on. And thank you to any of those who filled in our baseline survey, which we're going to redo in a year's time to see whether we've had any impact on changing clinical practice once the chapter's been in um, use. So basically, my conclusions are, we know that estimated requirements are a starting point only, and your clinical judgment and monitoring are essential. Although we've used a systematic approach to identify, collate, and review the clinical studies and guidelines, there's still a huge gaps in the evidence base, and you need to be aware of those. There are a variety of methods available for estimating requirements, and you can choose which one you would like to use, but just be aware of the strengths and limitations. And I would argue that it's our individual responsibility as clinicians to ensure our practice is supported by evidence. And I would just say, never blindly follow guidelines, including ours, and critically appraise all the evidence you encounter, including what we're presenting to you in the pocket guide. And I'd just like to finish by thanking the wonderful team that I've been working with for the past two and a half years. Um, Bruno Mafrici from Nottingham, Claire Salisbury from Liverpool, Joe Cope from Aintree and Danielle Judges from Kent, who were the main part of the project, and then Alison Culkin from London and Christine, my colleague at King's, who helped us with the review methodology. Thank you very much. <laughs>